Hello everyone. Welcome to the introduction of the popular culture. This lecture is part of your paper on media, culture and society. This lecture will introduce you to the ideas related to the concept of popular culture and will enable you to understand the nuances involving in defining the term. You will learn about the changes that have taken place in the society which makes it difficult to give a clear-cut definition of popular culture. You will be able to observe the significant role of state and media in redefining popular culture in contemporary society. This lecture traces the trajectory of the development of the term popular culture and its varied interpretations in media and cultural studies. The assumptions on the basis of which popular culture came to be defined has been identified and the problems involved in them has been discussed. The entry of popular culture in the Indian context outlines the issue of caste-based performances which aim to differentiate itself from the so-called mainstream culture. We will also learn the contemporary use of popular culture through the state, media and free market. Part 1. Popular Culture An Introduction Generally, what comes to your mind when you hear the word popular culture? Do you visualize a gathering of local people, mela and performances therein? Do you associate it with something different from the elite culture? Or do you compare it with folk and mass culture? In this section, we will discuss the trajectory of how popular culture has come to be identified and defined and look at the possibly different way of conceptualizing the term. In its original form, the term popular was used to mark the differentiation between the mass of the people from the wealthy and educated classes. Popular culture came to be identified with the former and later considered it to be different. It should be noted that this term was not exempt from politics. There was a kind of ambiguity that revolved around the term in two senses. First, there is ambiguity about the extent to which popular culture is defined by media corporations or state agencies and imposed on the people or derived from the social experiences of the people. Secondly, there is ambiguity in terms of whether popular culture is an expression of a subordinate or powerless class, class position or an alternative mechanism of offering resistance to the dominant, official and mainstream culture. The study of popular culture therefore needs to be located in the social production and reproduction of meanings related and defined through the economic and political divisions in the society. Popular culture thus needs to be understood not only through a relation between class and culture but also through the complex relations that exist through several other social interdictions like gender, religion, caste and ethnicity. One therefore needs to contextualize the use of the term popular culture and cannot simply define it in terms of antagonisms between the lower and the upper classes. Number one, rethinking popular culture. You may be wondering why popular culture cannot be identified through a clear-cut divide between the two classes. This is because of two reasons. First, culture is never static. It undergoes a process of change, modification, accommodations and assimilations over a period of time. Second, 
there is a continuous struggle of classes to control the means of production and exchange of cultural goods. And as such, the classes are not necessarily always in conflict, but also interact with each other and incorporate few elements of each of them in their culture. The dominant culture may try to define a cultural field is faced with opposition from others, but it is impossible to evade it entirely. The subordinate classes encounter with the dominant culture in compromised forms, which allows some room to accommodate the opposing class values. This is the reason Storé considers popular culture to be a terrain marked by resistance and incorporation. This view is corroborated if we take into consideration Gramsci's departure from traditional Marxism, where he claims that hegemony of the dominant class is not achieved easily through manipulation, rather is a complex process where the dominant group has to engage in some kind of negotiations with the opposing class that ultimately results in some accommodation of the conflicting interests of the subordinate groups. Ultimately, what results is a combination of imposition, opposition and accommodation in multiple permutation and combinations. Poitvin and Reiker argue that cultural traditions of the subordinate groups is not an outcome of passive repetitions of dominant culture, rather involves an active process of selective acceptance of cultural elements of the dominant group and also their reinterpretations. Before moving ahead, let's look at the three definitions or usages of popular culture given by Stuart Hall. Popular is associated with the culture of the masses, which is free from manipulation and is supposed to be consumed passively. Popular culture refers to all those things that the people do or have done, but who these people are is vague and incoherent. 3. Popular culture needs to be defined in terms of continuous relationship, both influence and antagonism between popular and dominant culture. Popular culture, assumptions and contestations. One of the most important assumptions related to popular culture that it is closely aligned to the culture of the subalterns or the marginalized sections of the society. Guy Poetvin considers this as a set of fables or stories which implies that there is an element of fictionality and orality defined by the power structures in the society. Moreover, certain questions remain unanswered in terms of who wrote popular literature. Who were the audiences? Were there any literary conventions or rules followed while writing it? And most importantly, were there any kind of internalized censorship that took place in this production? Secondly, studies on popular culture lament about the question of a lost origin as discussed in the above mentioned questions. This is because of the assumption that popular culture is oral in nature, whereas classical dominant culture 
is in written form. This opposition does not hold true as Guy Podvin argues that later may be orally transmitted and written text may have large components of oral or popular traditions like the Puranas in India. It should therefore be noted that the division between classical and popular is an ideological division. The representatives of the dominant culture try to exercise a right of control in cultural matters. Culture becomes a site of contestations where different social categories compete for positions of supremacy. The opposition to the dominant culture by other groups who try to subvert it is recognized to be a part of the popular culture. However, this distinction between popular and classical implies an essentialist conception of culture. Moreover, it reveals how a particular group or community constructs its cultural identity through opposition to the other. Thirdly, the antagonism between popular culture and classical culture presupposes that they are divided into closed watertight compartments and as such have no interaction. However, culture needs to be studied as communication. It is an ongoing process of emergence which takes place due to continuous interactions. Guy Poetvin argues that whatever might be the conditions, both these cultures always have interaction because they cannot remain immune to each other. He stresses that popular and elitist are not absolute entities, rather share a polemical relation. The differences are created as each group wants to use culture as a strategy for constructing and maintaining their identity. The identity is maintained through a set of structures of signification shared by members of the cultural group. This set of structures is symbolic in nature. like certain emblems, symbols, images, festivals, memories, rituals, etc., which they engage in their everyday lives. Popular culture therefore needs to be seen as performances which do not remain static but are subject to changes or modification in interaction with the dominant or classical culture. In India, as Sharmila Rege points out, popular culture can be understood in the context of the emergence of cultural studies in the country and its engagement with modernity. Cultural studies in India delineated three major trends in terms of analysis of modernity. First is the rejection of modernity, where Western modernity was considered to be dangerous and as such was avoided. During this phase of anti-colonial struggle, popular culture was seen as something authentic and pre-colonial tradition and community. The pre-modern became the basis of resistance and assumed the popular to be a homogeneous mass engaged with resistance against the dominant culture. Second is the interrogation of modernity, where culture is considered to be a part of a network of social and political relations and as such defined 
popular culture more in terms of mass mediated forms like cinema, art, etc. However, this second approach did not question the caste based cultural forms that were detrimental to the national culture and identity. Third is the consumption of modernity which rejects the concept of popular and replaces it with the notion of public culture. The notion of public is seen as contestations between the state and the middle classes where it is considered to be constituted by cricket, tourism, food and cinema. Consumption becomes a primary activity of social life. Separating the spheres of consumption and production, leaving out those who could not enter the domain of consumption. The popular is appropriated by modernity and vice versa through unequally. The popular is appropriated by modernity and vice versa though unequally. Popular culture therefore need not be seen as a form of resistance or something on whom the dominant cultural form is superimposed. It can be both emancipatory as well as imprisoning, resisting yet containing. Popular culture thus can be thought of as containing different layers within it. Layer of folk practices, layer of reinvented alternative practices, etc. State, media and popular culture in India. In contemporary India, the state, media and free market have become the significant centers of cultural production by drawing elements of popular culture. Vivod Parthasarathy argues that the media industry projects elements of popular culture as a decontextualized and a depoliticizing cultural wear. The media does not aim to promote popular culture through representations, rather uses it to attain its material and ideological objectives. The state, he asserts, performs a dual role in the process of producing culture. First, by directly producing or patronizing culture through media institutions, by providing finance to regional folk culture centers, and also by sponsoring various cultural events. Secondly, it indulges in regulation and selective promotion of cultural practices through Central Board of Film Certification or CBFC, taxation structures and pattern of subsidies. With the opening of private channels in the early 1990s due to economic liberalization, there has almost been an end to the monopoly of the state in television production and distribution. Partisarity considers it appropriate to understand popular culture through the notion of alternative communication, which enables one to look into multiple links between the politics of resistance and the emancipatory dimensions of the arts. The politics of resistance by the media through popular culture should primarily aim at questioning the existing structures, bringing unity among the same cultural groups performing similar cultural practices and engaging in a constructive criticism of modes of representation in such similar cultural practices. With the massive expansion of mass media market in India, popular culture no longer remains within the confines of a particular community or region. 
it gets absorbed eventually into the global culture industry. For example, Bhangra was a local cultural form which was transformed into metropolitan Punjabi popular music. Similarly, the folk pop in India also indicates how a large number of people have access to such music and make modifications and claim to be the creators of this music. It creates a kind of paradoxical situation where on one hand technology democratizes communication by bringing the local cultural form to the global cultural arena and on the other hand tries to control and modify the popular to suit its needs. Popular culture becomes an alternative communication in a real sense if it is oriented towards a restoration of subordinate knowledge systems and public spheres that formed around the village chalk or square tea stalls and street corners. Such public spheres contributed towards protesting and raising their voice against dominant socio-cultural practices, thereby creating in a true sense a public sphere. However, the growth of media like television and internet has relegated these spaces and has made people confined to isolated corners of their homes. Consequently, the citizens have become market-driven public entities. Furthermore, when popular culture gets absorbed by the consumerist culture industry, it is represented in a homogeneous manner. The state tries to construct and impose a certain kind of culture, which is similar to a national culture. In order to achieve their goal, both state and the market subvert the dissent and diversities which constitutes an intrinsic character of cultural practice. The Jalsa as popular culture, a study in Pune, Maharashtra. The Satya Shodhak Jalsa is basically an in instructional theatre of the non-Brahmins who came into emergence in the 1890s. Sharmila Rege points out that it became prominent as an alternate popular form challenging the caste-based tamashas. The Satya Shodhak Samaj or community was formed through unity and mobilization of the peasants, artisans and other lower castes in 1873. It made use of different folk forms such as Pawara, Balad, Abhangs, Verses and Kirtan, devotional music, which they used to disseminate their message to the masses. The content of these different folk forms were derived from the messages and poems of Shatya Shodhak leaders like Phule and were articulated to suit with the present times. In order to differentiate itself from the caste-based tamashas, the Jalsa began with Gaan, a devotional offering to Lord Ganesha. But Ganesha was invoked as Ganapati that implied the leader of the people. Similarly, Gavlan, that is, a comical act performed by an effeminate male character based on a dialogue between Krishna and the milkmaids performed in Tamashas was replaced by a dialogue between a non-Brahmin hero and the Brahmin women of the village, which was enacted by males. Furthermore, the Jalsas did not incorporate the Lavani or Mujra, that is an erotic performance by the female performers that is being done 
in a tamashas. What they replaced it with was songs in praise of education and science and incorporated elements criticizing the social evils like dowry and forced widowhood and problems of the peasants. In its attempt to differentiate itself from caste based tamashas, the Satya Shodak Jalsa redefined the form and content of its performance. The contradictions between the Brahmin and the non Brahmin Melas gained momentum in Pune in 1922 with the emergence of the Chhatrapati Mela. It was performed by uneducated troops and was a combination of the Satya Shodak Jalsa and Ganesh Mela. The Chhatrapati Mela portrayed the Brahmins to be socially and economically powerful during the colonial rule, who exercised their power on the lower castes and as such were not the true leaders of nationalism. Rege points out that it was told to her that Chhatrapati Melas were unsafe for Brahmin women as obscene references were made to them. When asked, the Mela organizers told her that the same happens in a Brahmin Melas where educated Brahmin women were ridiculed. However, the point to be noted is how popular cultural form like the Satya Shodak Jalsa or Chhatrapati Mela have countered or questioned the claim of political and moral leadership of the Brahmins in Pune. Conclusion Summing up this lecture, we hope that you have understood the term popular culture. Popular culture can refer to a wide variety of practices ranging from mass culture to non-dominant and alternative cultural form. The distinction between dominant and popular culture might be somewhat a kind of distortion as they interact with each other and as such popular culture should be understood within a continuum of dominance and resistance. It is more or less a political activity that works towards a transformatory politics in the society. In the Indian context, popular culture came to be understood through the ways in which it engaged itself with modernity. The state worked towards simultaneously regulating and democratizing the culture. The media and the market aims to acquire ideological and material benefits respectively. They do it by drawing elements of popular culture in the redesigning and packaging of different versions of culture. Despite the attempt of creating a homogeneous culture by the state, media and the market, popular culture remains a site of contestations and conjunctions. For more details, please read the e-text of this lecture properly and attempt the questions in the end. Thank you.